criminal referrals, and Zelensky in Washington. Ours is not a system of justice where foot soldiers go to jail and the masterminds and ringleaders get a free pass. The January 6th committee releases its long-awaited report and makes history by asking the Justice Department to criminally prosecute former President Trump. Plus... Mr. President, you don't have to worry. Uh, we are staying with Ukraine. Ukrainian President Zelensky makes a surprise visit to Washington to meet with America's commander-in-chief. Your money is not charity. It's an investment in the global security and democracy. And to make a direct appeal to Congress. Next. This is Washington Week. Corporate funding is provided by... For 25 years, Consumer Cellular's goal has been to provide wireless service that helps people communicate and connect. We offer a variety of no-contract plans, and our U.S.-based customer service team can help find one that fits you. To learn more, visit ConsumerCellular.tv. Additional funding is provided by... Ku and Patricia Ewan through the Ewan Foundation, committed to bridging cultural differences in our communities. Sandra and Carl DeLay Magnuson, Rose Herschel and Andy Shreves, Robert and Susan Rosenbaum, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Once again, from Washington, moderator Yamish Alcindor. Good evening and welcome to Washington Week. This week, the January 6th committee finally released its full 845-page report and a trove of interviews, transcripts from key witnesses. Lawmakers reveal that the committee is sending four criminal referrals for former President Trump to the Justice Department for inciting an insurrection, conspiracy to defraud the United States, conspiracy to make a false statement, and obstruction of an official proceeding. The committee also referred to the House Ethics Committee for Trump-allied Republican lawmakers, Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy, and Representatives Andy Biggs, Jim Jordan, and Scott Perry for, quote, failure to comply with subpoenas. Here's January 6th committee member Jamie Raskin, a Democrat from Maryland, explaining the actions. We understand the gravity of each and every referral we are making today, but we have gone where the facts and the law lead us and inescapably they lead us here. The report also says one man, Donald Trump, is to blame for the Capitol attack and that Trump should be barred from ever holding elected office again. In a statement, Trump lashed out at the committee and accused lawmakers of carrying out a, quote, witch hunt against him. Joining me to discuss this historic week, Scott McFarlane, congressional correspondent for CBS News, Ryan Riley, justice reporter for NBC News, and joining me around the table, Sungmin Kim, White House reporter for the Associated Press, and Mario Parker. He is a national politics editor at Bloomberg News. So thank you all for being here. Scott, let's dive into this week and into this report. Uh, what's your biggest takeaway when you look at the report, you look at all the names, including not just former President Trump, but so many others that lawmakers say were part of a plot that led up to January 6th? Near the back of the report, I keep staring at one of the recommendations from this panel. After all 18 months of their investigation, the 10 public hearings, the 1,000 plus interviews, the 1 million plus records, and one of their recommendations is Congress should move to use the protections of the 14th Amendment to prevent Donald Trump from running for high office again because of his ties to an insurrection. No matter one's view on January 6th or the investigations that came from it or all the work that's been done, we are quite clearly in history book area when a congressional panel is asking for Congress to utilize the 14th Amendment against a former president. There was so much in there that felt like the written word version of the public hearings, kind of the codified record of what we saw. But it's hard to escape two things, first of all that the compelling nature of a synchronized, choreographed congressional hearing, the likes of which we've never seen before, with tens of millions of viewers, is likely more potent than a very long Christmas week report issued by this panel. I mean, I'll tell you one thing, though, Yamish. They were given a mandate to work until January 2nd, 2023. They really squeezed every drop out of that time frame, didn't they? They absolutely did. I mean, we here we are two days before Christmas, <laughs> 
and we have to talk about this. But Scott, you talked about something, which is that this this committee, it talked about barring former President Trump from holding office. So I want to come back to you, Scott, and just ask, how realistic is that? Do we think that Congress will ever get to that point, especially as we enter a new phase of divided government? The 118th Congress, the one that comes up January 3rd, I have a better chance of winning the lottery and the NBA MVP award than that happening. A Republican-controlled U.S. House has promised it is dissolving this January 6th committee. It's going to investigate security failures from that day, and they're going to investigate the operations of the January 6th committee itself. There are any number of Trump loyalists who composed this House Republican conference. This investigation is over from the congressional side next week. And Ryan, uh, even as, as this investigation is over, they're hoping this ends up on your beat. They're hoping that the, the Department of Justice takes action here. But these criminal referrals, they hold no legal weight. So explain, if at all, how this might influence the Department of Justice, or could this all end up being symbolic? You know, in some ways, <clears throat> potentially, as uh, a lot of uh, former federal prosecutors have said, this could potentially backfire because, the, you know, the Justice Department doesn't like to look like it's being led around by the nose by the committee. And I think that the committee turned over a lot of really valuable information and got information that I think that federal prosecutors would have had a really tough time uh, bringing up because there would have, wouldn't have been a necessarily a criminal element that they would be able to investigate. There, you know, you can't have uh, criminal investigators in the Justice Department essentially just going around and figuring out what Donald Trump was doing on these certain times and getting into a lot of these details where there's no obvious uh, crime that a federal grand jury, for example, would be able uh, to look into. So they did really bring up a lot of really interesting information. I've been diving over, of course, all of those transcript al transcripts along uh, with everyone else. And I think that they did bring a lot of uh, information to the forefront. I think, you know, Cassidy Hutchinson's testimony, especially, um, and, and that dramatic television moment uh, was really something that this committee uh, will be remembered for in the long run. But remember, the Justice Department, in addition to that ongoing investigation into Trump, is really still in, only in the first half of this investigation uh, in terms of just the number of defendants who went uh, inside the Capitol. Uh, you know, there are about 900 people who have been uh, charged thus far, uh, but that's only a fraction of the total number of people who a lot of online sleuths have told me and identified uh, have gone in, either gone inside the building or who attacked law enforcement officers outside. The total number you're looking at there is around 3,000. So they have a really long uh, road ahead. And another big news uh, thing that came out of the, Jan of, uh, the Congress this week on the January 6th beat was that the Justice Department's getting a lot of money for those investigations. That was came through the omnibus bill um, and will uh, ultimately keep this investigation going forward until that statute of limitations potentially expires uh, five years out, unless we see some massive change uh, in the presidential administration. All important things to think about as we go forward. Sungmin, I want to talk to you about the legacy of this committee. Never before in history has a committee referred a former president for a criminal prosecution to the Justice Department, even if there's no legal weight to it, legal weight to it. I wonder what you make of the political implications here. Well, I think what the what the January 6th committee was trying to do beyond their recommendations, beyond the criminal referrals, was to really create this document, this historical record to really recount and really make their point about what exactly was responsible for January 6th. You know, Scott talked about how Republicans wanted to take a uh, wanted to want, want to investigate security failures uh, next year. The January 6th committee did look into that, and they emphasized that while there were failures, the, the, the fault uh, lies with one man that day, and that's Donald Trump, from his inactions, his stoking of uh, his stoking of these election uh, conspiracies, these election lies heading up to the riot on that day. Um, so I think that was really the mission of the committee. And I also do think just the, the how they were able to convey this information will be a lasting legacy for them. I think it was really, um, you know, you talk about a dense 800 page report versus these powerful, compelling hearings. I think what made some of the testimony so compelling for even Republicans is and in particular Republicans in the Senate, other Republicans on Capitol Hill, is that these were words coming from some people who were among Trump's closest allies. We saw new footage this week of Hope Hicks, one of Trump's closest aides in the White House, talking about that day. We saw footage from Jared Kushner, Ivanka Trump, all of these close senior White House aides talking about what he did or did not do on that day and leading up to that day. And that was very powerful. And I think that was a really uh, compelling um, uh, recollection for the public 
super large. That was, as you said, that was really all compelling. I also wonder what you make of the these ethics committee referrals. Is there anything that's going to come from that when you think of of the fact that this committee is taking this this action right before January third, when the Republicans are going to take control? Well, the House ethics committees, ethics committees on Capitol Hill, are evenly divided to kind of avoid that partisan shift when control shifts from one party to another. But at the same time, you know, we, I, I think what's going to come up in this in, in the argument in, in sort of the political discourse is that Republicans, when they take charge of the House in a matter of days, they are going to be pushing a lot of oversight, a lot of investigations on the Biden administration. And I think Democrats, I wouldn't be surprised if they point to perhaps their lack of uh, compliance uh, that has referred them over to the Ethics Committee as reason, as, as kind of a hypocrisy point here. And Mario, it's really interesting um, when you think about sort of what, what happens next. You have former Vice President Mike Pence, who we saw running through the Capitol, saying that he hopes the DOJ doesn't charge Trump. Then you have Senator Mitch McConnell telling NBC News that he thinks that Trump's role in the party has been diminished. What are you hearing from Republicans? What are Republicans saying about all of the things that we're just talking about? Yeah, I think over the last month, six weeks or so, we've seen a culmination of just this, what we're going to see over the next year, which is a warring within the Republican Party, a fight for the soul of the Republican Party as well. So you saw the shot that Mitch McConnell that took it, president, former President Donald Trump this week, saying he's politically weakened. Uh, Mike Pence, who just finished up a book tour based off the calendar that typically makes Means that he may have presidential aspirations. There's no road still to the White House without that, at least for the Republican nomination, without that 30 percent or so of the GOP base that is still kind of rock solid for pre former President Donald Trump. So right now we're going to see, at least for the next, I mean, the calendar by mid-2023, we'll be looking at 2024 presidential election, and Republicans have a lot of soul searching to do, particularly after that disappointing midterm performance. And Scott, what, what Mario is talking about is the fact that there is this sort of fight going on within the Republican Party. You have Mitch McConnell saying, no, we're not going to have just Trump-backed candidates be the, be the candidates that we go with again. But you also have more than 150 incoming or people who will be in Congress next next um, next term saying that they have denied or questioned the 2020 election results. So you have a lot of people who agree or at least say out loud that they agree with President Trump. So I wonder where this leaves the Republican Party when you think about sort of the, the fight that's going on here. Yeah, more than 100 so-called election deniers won seats in the U.S. House 11 days from now. They're in the majority. They control the committees. They control the legislative agenda. They control the purse strings of the U.S. government. So they're going to have quite a footprint. What's more, over the next 11 days, Kevin McCarthy is having leverage exacted on him by that group as he seeks to be Speaker of the House. They are not going to be irrelevant here in Washington. So the Trump ardent supporters in the U.S. House have a political forcefulness about them, which we're going to see, especially as this new Congress begins. And, and Ryan, as this new promise begins, I want to, in some ways, go back to the transcripts that we're seeing. Um, you think about the fact that Cassidy Hutchinson is something that someone whose name has been mentioned here. Um, there are some who say when you look at what she's saying, which is that her lawyer was telling her not to say things or at least to say that she doesn't recall things when she believes that she recalls them. Um, what does that tell you about sort of all the other people we saw in these transcripts say, I do not recall? I mean, boy, I have, first of all, I have to say, boy, was that cinematic that uh, the, if you read through that transcript, there's this moment where she's having this sort of crisis of conscience. She's driving back to her parents' place in New Jersey and, you know, irresponsibly, I'd say, probably starts looking at Wikipedia while she's driving and comes upon a Watergate um, entry, ends up uh, ordering the book gets delivered to her parents' house. She goes through this book over the weekend about, you know, a Watergate whistleblower and what he did. It was written alongside uh, Bob Woodward and then ultimately decides to make this pivot and make this decision. And it really does, it is really damning uh, for the Trump team because, you know, there's this obvious effort, it seems, that she says to put forward, um, essentially cover up for the president. And I think that there's a lot of supporting evidence of that. And she can point to all of this, um, you know, ev other evidence of her phone calls that she made and, you know, the Uber that she ordered 
heard when she was leaving that can really support, I think, the underlying uh, contention there is, which is that this Trump uh, world lawyer uh, was trying uh, to basically squash any of this public testimony and and essentially uh, stop the January 6th committee from getting the information uh, that it was seeking. So, yeah, I wouldn't want to be in his shoes uh, today in terms of uh, going forward with that potential investigation into uh, trying to stop the January 6th committee from getting information uh, that they were seeking. And Ryan, you touched a bit on it, but I want to ask you specifically, you had a new a story out recently this week. It says, Intel community escapes major criticism by January 6th committee for missing foreseeable capital violence. Break down your story in your latest reporting. Yeah, you know, I think while the January 6th committee did this great uh, uh, presentation on television, one of the real failures, I think, of this committee was evaluating these real serious intelligence failures in the lead up to January 6th. You know, after September 11th, we had these evaluations and talking about the silos that we saw and all the missed uh, warning signs that were there. And a lot of this was just happening online and in broad view. Uh, And there were a lot of stories written by journalists. There were just a ton of red flags that were going up ahead of January 6th about how this could get violent. And you've and I don't, I don't think we have really have a firm answer exactly about what went wrong there. You know, we've gotten bits and pieces of it here, including you know reporting in the Washington Post, reporting I've done uh, myself, report, reporting that other people have done. But we haven't really gotten this really thorough look at what exactly went wrong, and especially at a time when you're about to give an extra half billion dollars to the FBI uh, annually, you would think that a Congress would really want to look and say, okay, how can we make sure that something like this doesn't happen in the first place? And instead, I think the committee tries sort of awkwardly in a lot of spaces to pivot back to Donald Trump, uh, even when there are obvious uh, intelligence failures. And, you know, two things can be true at the same time. These things aren't mutually exclusive. You can contend that Donald Trump did these things that were wrong and this was a horrible situation. You can also say that there's a lot of evidence out there that should have made sure uh, that the FBI uh, and uh, Capitol Police, DHS, were more prepared for uh, violence on January 6th. Yeah. Um, The other thing that I think, when when you look at this report and look at sort of all of the recommendations that they're making, Scott, the Electoral Count Act, it's being reformed now by Congress because of the omnibus bill. Do you think that that's the biggest legislative action that we're going to see? Could we possibly see anything else come out? It's one of the things that had bipartisan support almost from the jump, although I'll note the Senate prevailed in the battle between the House and Senate on this. The baseline change that I think is most fundamental is that on January 6, 2021, you needed only one member of the House and one member of the Senate to object to stop the certification process and force a debate. In this new legislation, which was passed by the Congress this week, it's got to be 20 percent of the House and perhaps more of a threshold, 20 percent of the Senate, which makes it more difficult to gum up the works. The House bill, which was championed by members of that January 6 committee, saw for it to be 33 percent. But the Senate, as is often the case in these disputes, prevailed on this one. But here it is, signed into law imminently nearly two years after the Capitol riot. It's something that got done, but it may be the biggest legislative effect from January 6. And Mario, before we turn to Zelensky's visit, I have to pause and say that the House Ways Means Committee, apart from January 6, they were they got something done too. They are releasing the president's tax former president's tax returns, President Trump's. The New York Times says that the the tax returns show that former President Trump paid $1.1 million during his presidency, but zero dollars, that's right, zero dollars in 2020. We covered Trump together. What's your big takeaway from the the tax returns finally getting released? Well, he fought tooth and nail, if you remember, (laughs) for a long time on this. He knew that it could be a a damning subject. If you go back to his debate with Hillary Clinton years ago, he said that not paying taxes makes him smart. But at the same time, that doesn't... That juxtaposes against this patriotism and America first mantra that he takes up as well. Uh, It's been a bad six to eight weeks for someone who's starting their 2024 presidential bid. And the news just keeps getting worse and worse for former President Donald Trump. Yeah. uh, Well, meanwhile, this week, as we're talking about all the things that were going on here at home, defending a, a democracy abroad was also front and center in the nation's capital. On Wednesday, Ukraine's President Vladimir Zelensky made a wartime visit to Washington. During a meeting at the White House, President Biden pledged to supply Ukraine with a highly sophisticated Patriot missile system. That evening, Zelensky also addressed a joint meeting of Congress. So, Sung Min, you have great new reporting out. You, you went through all the details of how we ended up getting this meeting. So, break down your reporting for us. Why was Zelensky here now? Did he achieve what he came to achieve? So this idea had been tossed around for months, both on Capitol Hill among the congressional leaders. Pelosi had talked with other members of the so-called Big Four about when the security situation is right, 
the idea of bringing uh, President Zelensky to Congress to address Congress. And this is also an idea that administration officials had talked about for some time. A U.S. official told me that Biden and Zelensky had talked about a meeting. So in that December 11th phone call between the two leaders, uh, President Biden, uh, feeling that the, sec the security situation was, was okay, uh, asked him, you know, if you still want to come, we would be happy to host you. And and that was when President Zelensky said, the time is now right. I want to come. And once that December 11th phone call happened, this all ha this all proceeded very quickly. It was confirmed about a week later um, in terms of being able to bring him to Washington. And of course, security was very paramount for President Zelensky. And he had the cover, he had the protection of the U.S. government from the moment he left Ukraine and came to the U.S. He was on a U.S. Air Force jet when he arrived at at Joint Base Andrews, uh, just outside Washington. He was accompanied by the U.S. ambassador. He was traveling in a U.S. embassy vehicle as he went through Poland, uh, which is where he got on the airplane and then came here to Washington and had all sorts of protection while he was here. But he really delivered a powerful message when he was standing alongside Biden and when the president, President Biden, continued uh, pl continued uh, to uh, pledge U.S. support for the efforts in Ukraine. And I thought the his remarks on Capitol Hill, while it was certainly to the broader Congress, it really did seem aimed at House Republicans at many parts during the speech. You know, we know that there is a growing, uh, growing faction of Republicans on Capitol Hill, mostly in the House, but some in the Senate as well, who are getting more and more skeptical of this, this continued Ukraine aid. And there was a line that we played earlier where he said, your money is not charity. It's basically an investment in global security and democracy. It's being handled appropriately. And that is him trying to make the case that why what Congress is doing in terms of continuing to funnel aid really matters for the global community writ large. And what's been the impact, do you think, of his visit both on President Biden, who's been reluctant at times to give him all the weapons he wants, but also on those Republicans that you said are, are wondering whether or not they want to continue to give aid to Ukraine? For President Biden, it really closes out the calendar year, these past eight months, showing that, showing to the world that that the country remains united alongside Zelensky, alongside Ukraine. And it's a powerful image and a powerful signal that administration officials tell me they wanted to send, particularly as the fighting gets more tough, as the winter, you know, as the winter uh, comes. And for Congress, I'm not sure that what Zelensky said, as powerful as it was, changed much minds. Like, you had House Republicans either who attended the joint session or who did not come out and say, we still want more oversight of the more oversight of the money. We want to see inspectors general. We don't understand why we're spending U.S. taxpayer dollars abroad, and my constituents don't understand that. And I don't think that sentiment changes. I will be looking to see how much that sentiment grows in the next year as this war persists, because we don't know how long this is going to last. We don't know how long Russia is going to keep up with this invasion and how long Ukraine is going to need the U.S. support. Well, I'm so happy that you're here to break all that down, <laughs> because we needed all of that broken down. And Scott, I want to come to you. What are you hearing on Capitol Hill about Zelensky, the impact of Zelensky's visit? I was really struck with what I heard in the U.S. House chamber today. They were wrapping up the negotiations and the debate on that $1.7 trillion spending bill to keep the government open and keep the lights on. And as was just mentioned, a component of that is $45 billion in aid for Ukraine. And there on the floor today is Chip Roy, Republican from Texas, who has an outsized presence on the House floor sometimes, who characterized President Zelensky's speech in the House chamber as theater and expressed some heartburn about spending American taxpayer money on Ukraine and presumably channeling the voices of his constituents in the process. And then we saw with our own eyes in the House chamber some members of the Republican conference not stand. And we saw them not applaud as President Zelensky spoke. I don't know where the politics of this go in early 2023, but there seems to be a very reasonably sized faction of the House Republican conference that will not be interested in future aid for Ukraine. And I'll reinforce what I think is a key point. House Republicans control the purse strings next year. This is going to be messy. Messy is definitely going to be one way to put it. And Mario, in the 
minute we have left here. How much do you think this visit was also about reminding the American people, hey, Ukraine is happening, your tax dollars, they matter. Here I am to remind you of that. I think that's exactly the message Zelensky was trying to, it was a pressure campaign on the American public. It was a thank you note. He thanked the, the American public several times throughout the speech. And one line that was re really interesting was that he said that they're using the money responsibly, right? That was definitely toward uh, the Republicans and some of those House con Republicans constituents who worry about some type of malfeasance with the money as well. So he's saying that he he's a good steward of that money that he's getting from the American public. He thanks it, and then also that it's an investment in democracy as well. And with all that's going on in the American public, you think about sort of inflation and all this stuff, it's also just a reminder you should care about us. Yeah, no, absolutely. And you saw some of the rhetoric where he tried to tap into some of that patriotic vein. He mentioned the Battle of the Bulge, the Battle of Saratoga. He quoted FDR as well. So he was really going for some of those emotional heartstrings of the American public also. Definitely, definitely leaning in and reminding the American people that we matter in Ukraine. So definitely a powerful message. We'll have to leave it there for now. Thank you so much to our panel for joining us and for sharing your reporting. And be sure to tune in to PBS News Weekend for a look at the controversial facial identification technology being used at some airports this holiday season. And finally, I would like to thank and wish everyone a happy and healthy holiday season. I hope you can celebrate in your own ways across the country. I definitely hope that everyone is healthy and getting rest. Good night from Washington. Corporate funding for Washington Week is provided by Consumer Cellular. Additional funding is provided by Ku and Patricia Ewan through the Ewan Foundation committed to bridging cultural differences in our communities. Sandra and Carl DeLay Magnuson, Rose Herschel and Andy Shreves, Robert and Susan Rosenbaum, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you.